Hello, and welcome to episode 16 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, and advocates, and others who seek to improve the world. We're here today with uh, Kathleen Matthews, a former candidate for Congress in the state of Maryland in the 8th Congressional District and former executive at Marriott International. How are you doing today, uh, Kathleen? Great, great. Nice to be with you here in my living room, and I'm very impressed with your <laughs> incredible microphone you have here. Thank you. So um, the first question I'd like to pose to you today is, what are you currently doing or what have you ever done in your life to advance the public interest and why? Currently, I'm actually figuring out what my next step is, but I know it's going to be in public service. I ran for Congress last year thinking that I would have a chance to represent Maryland's 8th Congressional District in the U.S. Congress, and I was really motivated by um, my love for this region, my connection with the issues and the people of this region, um, but also uh, uh, I was convinced that I actually could get things done, and I think people are very frustrated by the lack of progress. So I made that decision to leave business where I'd been for 10 years. Prior to that, I'd been a journalist for 30 years mm -hmm. locally here in the Washington area. And I was hoping that I could advance issues like gun control, um, like uh, closing the achievement gap between mm -hmm. rich and poor kids in schools and mm -hmm. uh, white kids and minority kids. Uh, I was hopeful that I could help improve Obamacare, take it to the next step, make it even work better, mm -hmm. uh, that I could help raise wages for people who live in this area who haven't seen wage growth, mm -hmm. help make equal pay for equal work to enable women to support their families better. And so now I'm trying to figure out in the, in lieu of being able to represent this district in Congress mm -hmm. in 2017, mm -hmm. how do I advance those same issues? How do I make good on the campaign progress, uh, campaign promises and sort of the conversation I started with people? So um, I'm remaining very close to democratic politics. Mm -hmm attending the Democratic Breakfast Clubs. Um, I've been asked to MC and um, moderate panels for a lot of good charitable organizations. Coming up, I'm doing something for Habitat for Humanity of Maryland, um, something for multiple sclerosis in I Maryland. I saw that you're on the Women's Democratic Club moderating. I, I helped um, enlist some journalists to talk about this presidential ele election at the Montgomery County Women's Democratic Club. Uh -huh. I just returned from California where I was a trainer with mm -hmm. 100 women from around the world who are pursuing perceived to be sort of the leading voices in their countries mm -hmm. uh, for change for women and families. And mm -hmm. I was a trainer trying to help them with leadership skills mm -hmm. uh, through an organization with uh, called Vital Voices. Um, so I'm doing those things. I'm also tutoring uh, at Oakview Elementary in Silver wow. Spring, which is a Title I school because I believe that, you know, uh, at the grassroots, I can make a difference in the lives of a third and fourth grader who've been assigned to me. So I'm going to try to close the achievement gap with those two kids, mm -hmm. um, you know, one student at a time. So really in remaining engaged in the community mm -hmm. while I look for other opportunities to serve. It sounds like you've had a lot of professional success throughout your career, and yet you've sometimes made decisions to really advance the interests of others. And it sounds, it very clearly comes across that you're very passionate about an array of issues that you mentioned, and you're taking a lot of pains um, to really go out of your way to kind of help kids read, or you're gonna help moderate a debate, you're gonna do what you can. To, where does that come from? Why are you so motivated to help others when it's much easier, frankly, to have just continued in your path and been successful professionally and personally. I was lucky to grow up in a household where um, my mother was very involved in our local community. She mm -hmm. was a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. And so besides raising five kids uh, while my father worked full-time, she also um, was really involved in the community. And she passed that on to us. So growing up, I was involved in teaching uh, disabled children how to swim, tutoring in a low-income school in East Palo Alto um, uh, as a candy striper at the cancer ward at the local hospital. I did that in high school and then again in college. In college, I got involved in politics. Politics. Hmm. So I saw politics was also a pathway to help people and to serve. And that's what motivated me to come to Washington. And I thought um, that journalism, which was what I studied in college, mm -hmm. was a way to serve this community. That you basically, by pulling back the curtain, showing people what's going on, mm -hmm. telling them what's really happening in the schools, mm -hmm. what's happening in government, keeping government honest, but also giving people just basic information about the local crime, uh, crime rate. You know, whether there was um, uh, a spike in rapes in the area mm -hmm. or in pedestrian hit and runs. Mm -hmm. that, 
sharing those kind of things through local news with your community mm-hmm. helped that community. Mm-hmm. And so that was really my purpose as a journalist was to serve the local community. And that was really the mission of broadcasting in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and at the turn of the millennium when I was a local broadcaster. Mm-hmm. Moving forward, I was recruited to work for Marriott International, Mm -hmm. a a large local employer, but also a global employer. Mm -hmm. For me, there was an exciting opportunity to work as part of the global economy, so kind of a stretch opportunity for me professionally. Mm -hmm. But the portfolio I had, besides having communications, included all the global citizenship and the community relations and community partnerships. Um, And so in that role, I was forming partnerships, whether it was here in D.C. uh, with low-income women's groups trying to get them employment in our hotels, Mm -hmm. or in Rwanda, where I formed a partnership with a school that took low-income women and helped give them skills for hospitality and later jobs in the hotel we opened up in Rwanda. I formed partnerships like that for low-income women, low-income youth in South Africa, in India, um, you know, all over the world. And so I was able to, in my business career, not only help Marriott be successful, Mm -hmm. which allowed them to hire and employ more people, but also to find those kind of partnerships that would enable Marriott to help people who have been left out, you know, the disadvantaged. And so that, if you think of it, is a logical extension of sort of a purposeful life from journalism into uh, business that basically told me or kind of, you know, was the inner voice when I saw an opportunity to serve in Congress and said, go do it. That's another place where you can have an even broader impact for your local community. So I'm hearing that starting out, it was just instilled in you by your parents that public service is important. And then through a lifetime of habit, you've become more and more enamored with public service such that it seems as though I can tell you're exhilarated by the work that you do and going around the communities. Um, Can you talk about a little bit about, uh, I mean, it just sounds very exciting and it almost sounds, uh, there's always this dynamic where public service is supposed to be selfless and you're helping others, but at the same time, you get something out of it too, right? You, you, you are enjoy- so right. So, you know, I've done a lot of mentoring of women mm-hmm. and, and girls in particular over the years. And I have to say that those experiences are as much a mentoring experience for me. Mm-hmm. I, I learned something out of each one of those experiences. Uh, similarly, I um, believe that, you know, um, I once heard a quote that with your arms open wide, mm-hmm. With your arms wide open, the world opens wide. So think about that. You open up your arms Mm -hmm. and you basically have the opportunity to embrace and engage in a bigger world. It opens doors to you. And I just think that um, uh, we all have an obligation to serve and particularly those of us who have been fortunate in Mm -hmm. our careers, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, have had successes. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think even low income students will see an expanded universe if they're in that if they're given opportunities to serve how do you and to volunteer and to to meet new people and stretch kind of their horizons stretch their world so uh, actually um, a moment ago you mentioned um the word meaning and that you felt that this dedication to public service led to you having a more meaningful life right um i use the word purpose Kind of a purposeful life. A more purposeful life. A purpose. So, you know, being purposeful about what it is I can do in my job or whatever I'm doing that day that kind of makes the world a better place. Purpose as in I am I am conscious of every action I'm taking and I am deliberately acting and living each day. Exactly. And by opening myself up and providing opportunities. For instance, you let's just ground this in reality right now. You're, you're teaching students um, at a school. Now, I mean, it's pretty exciting. They, they, they may know you because you were on TV and, and you've had an illustrious career and they're coming, although they may be young, they may, I don't know if they know who you are or not, but do you think, how, how are they They don't benef- because I haven't been on television for 10 years. <laughs> so Maybe are, their parents do. <laughs> how are they benefiting um, from you, like you're coming in there and you're helping them and you're, and then, and then you're gaining how, what, what's the give and take there in that specific example? So I, you know, um, I'm just starting this tutoring. Um, uh-huh. I actually learned about the opportunity because I was doing lots of meet and greets in yeah. every neighborhood in the eighth congressional district during yeah. my campaign. And one of the last meet and greets, a woman told me I'm retired. She said, you talk a lot about the achievement gap. You talk about how we need to invest in our public schools. 
um, uh, have you ever thought about volunteering? And I said, well, you know, as a young girl, I, I volunteered. I also volunteered in my kids' schools. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, win or lose this election, I would really like to volunteer in a school because I actually think that's how you understand what is working and what is not working in schools. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to try to come up with sort of some big picture agendas, whether mm -hmm. it's in Montgomery County or in the state of Maryland or nationally, mm -hmm. I believe I'm going to have more credibility and understanding of what the challenges are mm -hmm. if I'm actually in a school working with students who have English as a second language, mm -hmm. who go home to parents who speak Spanish, uh, who are struggling through reading and writing, and then I figure out what it is they need. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be a better advocate because mm -hmm. of that experience. And for them, my feeling is that, you know, we have a lot of people uh, in their 60s mm -hmm. um, who are on the verge of retirement. Uh, people in their 70s who still, you know, have lots to contribute. And for them to be able to see an opportunity to volunteer in local schools mm -hmm. at a time when we don't probably have the budget to hire as many teachers as we really need yeah. to deal with the vast numbers of immigrant students coming from all over the world who don't have English as a first language or children with developmental disabilities. Maybe we can marry sort of retirees as volunteers with schools that need reading assistance. Hmm. Um, and, you know, is that something we should be looking at as a moonshot idea? Kind of like the Peace Corps was mm -hmm. for John F. Kennedy mm -hmm. or Teach for America was. Uh, you know, back um, 15 years ago. Perhaps there's an experience core that we could create. I'm gonna know, I'm gonna know that better mm -hmm. if I volunteer in schools and see what kind of impact I have. Interesting. Can so, I be helpful? Can so, I make a difference? So you mentioned uh, Kennedy um, and the Peace Corps, and of course there is AmeriCorps and there is Teach for America, but many individuals who seek to serve their country um, through, through civil service uh, are rejected, right? They don't have a 100% uh, acceptance rate. Now, if I want to join as a recruit for the infantry in Iraq, I'm 100% accepted. I mean, or not near, very many people are accepted. Right. Would you be, what do you think about the idea of a voluntary but guaranteed opportunity for young people or people or older people, people of any age, if they so choose to volunteer and become part of a civil public service corps. That's not required, you're not forced to, but if you want to, you're guaranteed a slot. What do you think about that? I think it's a I think it's a great idea. First of all, in the state of Maryland, mm -hmm. Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, mm -hmm. when she was lieutenant governor, was very successful getting a community service requirement. Mm -hmm. And so you have that. You've got to you've got to do some community service in order to graduate in Maryland. That's I think what that's a, me off, actually. I, I, I think it's a brilliant idea because yeah. it gives people a taste of it. And mm -hmm. and I, I can tell by the way you're responding to me mm -hmm. that that was inspiring to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you know, you help, but you're also helped by that experience. You learn leadership skills, exactly. you, know, you grow, you get challenged. And so I actually think that as we talk about um, how do we bring down the cost of college education, mm -hmm. how do we pay for college education for students who don't have the income to go, mm -hmm. um, perhaps there is a, uh, a, a benefit if you volunteer, that's how you earn from the government, right. college tuition. That there's sort of a, you don't just get, but you also give. And maybe, you know, we've just got to find the mechanisms for this. We've got to find a way that uh, you can do volunteer work in schools and, and the schools can manage it because so, their their main job is, is to get those kids taught every day. Oh. And managing volunteers is yeah. sort of not their job, but can that happen in a way that it makes their job easier, that it supplements and amplifies what they're able to do and amplifies their successes. So I, I love the idea of looking for creative and imaginative ways that we get more people engaged. I like this idea of giving. Um, I want to talk for a moment about the idea of civic responsibility, ownership of your community, and sense of belonging in the community. Um, I feel like uh, giving... A lot of people, it seemed, I want to talk about the difference between um, receiving from society, which we do. For instance, going to public schools, you know, the students themselves are not paying for their own education. They're receiving, when we drive on the roads, we receive the benefits. When I eat a hamburger, I know it's beef because the FDA checked it, and so I know that I'm receiving. Your tax dollars are paying for that, and even as a student, you're not paying taxes, but you ultimately one day will pay taxes, and your parents are paying those taxes. So it is sort of the compact we have that tax taxes basically fuel a government and those services that make our society better. So talk to me about the obligations incumbent upon every citizen, and in, I don't want to limit just the citizens, every individual living in this country. 
What do you think really is required? The government, people expect many things from the government, but what should government expect from the people? What should not even government, but non-government organizations, what should communities expect of each other? And what is living as a member of a community? What is our obligation to that community. Yeah, well, you're, you're sounding like Jack Kennedy, right? Ask not what uh, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I do think that we have so many good programs that are um, uh, making good on that promise and answering that question. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that there's more that we can do. Mm-hmm. And I also think, t- to be honest, a lot of the uh, dis- dissatisfaction with government mm-hmm. um, uh, is um, uh, because people are not engaged the way they they need to be. I mean, if you're invested in something, you're invested in it making making it work. You mm-hmm. want it to be successful mm-hmm. if you're part of it. Mm-hmm. If you're disenfranchised from it, you know, feel like it's not delivering anything from you and you're just sort of seeing it as this other entity, you know, you're only going to be further dissatisfied with it. So, you know, uh, voting is a very important part of that. Uh-huh political activism and, you know, getting involved in, in politics as you have, Mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, I, I thought, you know, running for office Mm -hmm. was a service, Mm -hmm. even though I didn't win, Mm -hmm. it was a service to put my views out there, to put myself out on the line, Mm -hmm. to be a voice as a woman, Mm -hmm. a woman's voice Mm -hmm. for sort of the issues that in my lens and my experience, I'm particularly passionate about and to give people another choice in the race. And um, uh, so I just think that we've got to look for ways to get people more excited about voting, Mm -hmm. more excited about volunteering in politics, more excited about running. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things I'm also doing is I'm uh, working with the board of Emerge Maryland. I joined their board, and Mm -hmm. this is a group that is trying to encourage more young women Mm -hmm. to run for office because there is a huge gender gap between the numbers of uh, women that put themselves out there in the arena to run and the number of men that do. Mm-hmm. And as a result, Maryland will have a federal delegation with uh, no Democratic women uh, when we lose Barbara Mikulski mm-hmm. um, and, Donna, uh, and Edwards. Donna Edwards. Yeah. Um, and at this point, the, the Republican women running for those offices are, are lagging way behind the, mm-hmm. um, uh, the Democratic men. Mm-hmm. Those Democratic men are great candidates, mm-hmm. but I just think we need more women to run mm-hmm. and, you know, more women in office. A 19%, which is what our Congress is, is not enough. And the state legislature is about the same. So I'm helping try to recruit women like Shebra Evans, who's mm-hmm. gone through Emerge Maryland, who's right. now running for the school board, uh-huh. and future women. We're just going through, I'm going through nominations as mm-hmm. part of the uh, nominating committee, and I'll be going through interviews of another group of 40 women yeah. who are hoping that they'll be part of the next class of Emerge Maryland. Similarly, I'm helping women like Katie McGinty, who's running for Senate as a Democrat in Pennsylvania. I'm helping Luann Bennett, who's running as a challenger, a Democratic challenger in Northern Virginia. Hmm. Um, just helping other women around the country try to get elected. So pivoting a little bit back to the topic of you, you've spent 30 years as a journalist. I know a journalist who once said to me, you know, I considered running for office, but then I decided I'd rather be throwing the darts than dodging them. So you've had experience for three decades working as a journalist, which you describe as really within the framework of the fourth estate, a public service to inform the electorate about issues, about politicians, investigative journalism, and now you've been on the other side. Can you reflect a little bit about the differences between throwing the darts, as it were, and dodging them as a candidate? So I think um, we need all four estates. I mean, you know, this government was founded on a um, judicial, executive, legislative branch, and really uh, the media as the fourth estate, I think, is an important component of that. And Mm -hmm. so I respect um, and am a huge consumer of all the journalism that is happening right now. I'm skeptical of a lot of the blogs and a lot of the kind of um, uh, more incendiary kind of um, coverage that we have Mm -hmm. in the social media sphere, but I also trust people to to read and digest and make their own opinions. So um, I loved what I did in journalism. I felt like I really did do a service Mm -hmm. to this, for this community. Mm -hmm. It got me very engaged in this community. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I also felt that I was at a point in my life where I thought I had skills that would work as a public official, Mm -hmm. and you have to run to Mm -hmm. become a public official. Um, So, um, uh, you know, it wasn't an easy decision because it's hard to run. Was it ever frustrating to deal with the press as a candidate? 
You know, I think that anybody who has ever been covered by the media mm -hmm. feels like the media doesn't do justice to the story. And some of that is just the constraints of the media to tell a story in short form. And also, you know, you don't necessarily have independent vision about yourself. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, I don't think any candidate would say that they loved the coverage about them because you always see more nuance in the story that, you know that you're that's that's about you. Yeah. So um, we're nearing... and I think the I think I think journalists really go into reporting with very good intentions of being um, fair, mm -hmm. of getting the facts right. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you don't, you lose your job. So there, you know, is a, an incentive of preservation in mm -hmm. trying to to be fair and do it right. But you also have to distill things down to um, on television. You know. 75 seconds so we're, <laughs> in print you know eight paragraphs you know so we're nearing the end of the podcast and on the topic of good intentions i'd like to kind of wrap things up on this last topic that you just mentioned journalists you just said approach their profession with good intentions it seems to me that you have approached politics and everything else in your life with good intentions can you reflect a little bit just about good intentions and how they've manifested in good work and how that's led to good things in society um, uh, for our listeners as kind of a parting word? I think when I, um, uh, you know, kind of look back on the 40 years that I've um, uh, been a professional post-college, mm -hmm. um, I am probably proudest of uh, number one, having put myself in the arena to run for office and taking that risk mm -hmm. and rallying, um, you know, 60 interns and 500 volunteers and 12,000 contributors to try to support my race and incredibly grateful mm -hmm. for what they did for me. And right now I'm trying to um, give them the return on investment that they didn't get when I lost the election by, um, you know, really helping out in this community and trying to do good things mm -hmm. in, in the interest of this community. Second thing would be um, uh, the ability I had at Marriott International, a big local employer um, uh, with 3,500 people at mm -hmm. its corporate headquarters in Bethesda, mm -hmm. um, but uh, 300,000 people who work for Marriott hotels around the world. Uh, to be able to actually create new jobs in places like Haiti, mm -hmm. where I led the effort to build a new hotel in Haiti after the earthquake, mm -hmm. um, to try to rebuild that economy through tourism, mm -hmm. uh, to form partnerships with programs in, as I said, Rwanda, uh, South Africa, India, elsewhere, that are giving jobs today in hotels, in Marriott hotels, for young disadvantaged youth, mm -hmm. um, to be a strong advocate for diversity, uh, elevating women into the company, mm -hmm. LGBT equality uh, and uh, inclusion in the company, and really helping women minorities in the LGBT community thrive at Marriott mm -hmm. and um, and really rise up in the ranks. And, um, and and as a journalist, I believe that you know for for thirty years. I was literally seven on their side when I looked at my local community. Mm -hmm. I was in schools giving, uh, you know, graduation speeches. I was trying to inspire youth with mentoring and letting them shadow me. Mm -hmm. I was covering education, showing education programs that worked and ones that didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, trying to cover local politics so people could make an informed decision when they voted. Those are the things I'm really proud of. And I'm just looking for that next opportunity to serve, you know, the next chance to, to actually do something, um, you know, that will even make this a better community. And I know that, you know, for me, it'll be exciting too, um, because I know that each one of those experiences I told you about, mm -hmm was an exciting and enriching opportunity for me. So you heard it straight from the mouth of Kathleen Matthews, that public service it can be a lifelong path that is full of purpose. As we try to make our own lives meaningful in a self-interested way, we are most able to actualize that purpose by dedicating ourselves to improving the welfare of our communities to whom the more we give to our communities, the more we feel we belong to those communities and it's a self-fulfilling positive feedback cycle. So thank you so much, Kathleen Matthews. This has been episode 16 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be with you next time.